Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Friday night study. This study is a continuation of the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And we've gone through a lot in the last uh, couple of years in these studies. And um, uh, this study here is a continuation of looking at M.L. Andreasen's letters to the churches. He's addressing the evangelical conferences in the mid-1950s, um, where the Seventh-day Adventists answered questions on doctrine from the evangelicals, producing the book called Questions on Doctrine. And M.L. Andreasen uh, was uh, aware of what was happening, and it, it sort of exposed uh, what was happening. So this is his perspective. Now, some historical revisionists have kind of rewritten this, written this history and put all kinds of spins on it to make M.L. Andreasen to be a bad guy. Um, people like George Knight definitely sees M.L. Andreasen as a bad guy. Uh, but I've read M.L. Andreasen's books and definitely uh, his books are spirit filled and an extreme blessing. But uh, before we begin this study, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, for the blessings of this past week, for the trials that we have faced, for our failures, and the way that you have picked us up and shown your love and mercy to us. We know, Lord, that we live in a time that is interesting, not just out there in the world, the things that are happening, but also within the church and within our lives. We know, Lord, that uh, we need your spirit uh, to guide and lead as we study. We have such a burden, Lord, for those around us and feel so helpless. But we know, Lord, that as we seek you and your presence, as we ask your Holy Spirit to work upon our hearts, as well as those that we come in contact, we know, Lord, that, that you can use us. And we pray that we can trust in the work that you are doing, even if we can't see the end from the beginning as you can. We pray for your spirit to be here now as we read of this history in the past and, and contemplate on how it affects us. And we ask, Lord, that you can give us wisdom uh, to help others who may be struggling with an understanding of your word, especially in regard to their personal salvation. We ask, Lord, that you can empower us, that we can live a Christ-like life, and that we can uh, have Christ's righteousness uh, upon us. Thank you for the time that we have together, for each person that joins in these studies, that watches them on YouTube. We just pray for a blessing upon them and their families. And we ask these things. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so welcome again. And uh, we're, we're just right in the thick of it here, um, talking about the changes that were being made or suggested in Ellen White's books because they had made, you know, notations in uh, Ellen White regarding Ellen White's statements to get her to say things that she didn't really say. And the evangelicals have a different type of language. And so the way that our ministers were addressing this, or leaders, was to remove the prejudice that exists between evangelicals, or prejudice that evangelicals have for, against Seventh-day Adventists, however you want to put that. So here we have uh, the statement. Um, well, I guess this is him talking. This is still Andreas and talking after the two men had suggested the insertion of notes and explanations in some of Ellen G. White's books that would give the reader the impression that she was not opposed to their new interpretation, they had another suggestion to make. This is a matter, they said, which will come prominently to the front in the near future and that we would do well to move forward with the preparation and inclusion of such notes in future printings of the Ellen G. White books. Now, 
I remember when I first became an Adventist and I read the great controversy and also patriarchs or patriarchs and prophets. Or was it, uh, let me see, was it patriarchs and prophets? Yes, patriarchs and prophets. And, and there's a chapter in, in both of those books on the sanctuary. Um, so I can't remember if it's in both books, uh, but it's going to be where Ellen White is talking about the Lord's, the, the Lamb's offering on the Day of Atonement, the different offerings on the Day of Atonement. And, and they put a footnote in there where Ellen White talks about how for the individual, you know, the sins are confessed upon the head of the scapegoat and, or not the scapegoat, the, the offering, the lamb or whatever the offering is. There's no sins confess, confessed on, uh, the Lord's goat, uh, by the way, but there is on the scapegoat. So I was just getting confused. But anyway, so on the offering that the individual brings, maybe I could bring this up. And so I noticed it. Like I noticed that, that there was something behind this footnote. And, uh, let's see if it's here. Let's look at the sanctuary. Pretty sure it's, or maybe it's not in, that must be in Prophets and Kings. Or Patriarchs of Prophets and Kings. See if I can find this. Uh, what are you looking for, Theodore? The chapter called The Sanctuary. Okay. Um, I thought it was in, but I can't seem to find a chapter called The Sanctuary. No. Hmm. Well, I'm just going to do it this way. Because I know the one word that's there, uh, individual. Okay, this is dealing with the individual offering. So it mustn't be there. I mean, it's been a lot of years since I've looked at this, about 40 years since I looked at this statement. Well, what are you looking for, Theodore? Because I've just been reading. Looking, well, I'm looking for a statement of Ellen White's where she talks about the, the offerings for the individual in the sanctuary. Okay, so this is, the, yeah, it's the same. It's it's in a chapter entitled uh, T- The Tabernacle and Its Services um, in Patriarchs and Prophets. And it's also in The Great Controversy. I think the same statement. No, so I guess it's only in Patriarchs and Prophets. That's why. Are we are we talking about the, the, the offering of blood, the sin of, the sinner acknowledges the authority of his law, confessed and guilt of, of transgression. Well, it, it's about the offering for the individual. So that's page 356 of Patriarchs and Prophets. Yeah, it's it's in. Uh, well, it starts in page 352. Right. But yeah, so this is dealing with. Um, so first it starts with the daily service consisted of the mornings and evening burnt offering the offering of sweet incense on the golden offering and the special offerings for individual sins. And there was also offerings for Sabbath, new moon, special feasts. So she's going to go through all these different uh, offerings. And I'm just trying to see if they have this footnote in here because on the EG white disc, uh, they should have the footnote. Um, I might have to find this another time. Okay. So it's going to talk about the day of atonement. Just there on page 356, it says, by the offering of blood, the sinner acknowledged the authority of the law, confessed the guilt of his transgression, and expressed his faith in him who was to take away the sin of the world. But yeah, he... That's not what I'm looking for. So basically, I'm looking for the footnote that they had. So I'm going to have to find that. The, the point is, what they do is they make a footnote, and they correct Ellen White. And, and so I'm going to have to find it. And, and that's what I'm thinking Andreasen is referring to, these, these sort of uh, comments or footnotes where they're going to correct Ellen White's books. So I'll, I'll find it for another time because uh, I don't know where it is. But I know it's, I know it's in the Conflict of the Ages series. And it, it should have been in pa- Patriarchs and Prophets in the Great Controversy. But anyway, so the idea is that they wanted to change her books. And so she says some things at times that people think are wrong. And, and so people put footnotes in to correct her. And it's not just clarifying, right? 
it's it's correcting. So I, I want to find that where they correct her. Okay, so I leave to the reader to decide why the men were in haste to get the notes and explanations into the Ellen White books. Could it be that doing this would constitute a fait accompli, an accomplished fact, a thing that had already been done and which would be difficult or impossible to change? Now, this is an important consideration for there is reason to believe that things are happening to other of our books. And there's a definite movement to change our doctrine in other matters. And this should be further explored before it is too late. Now, the idea, you know, that the church changing the doctrines. Now, um, I was raised in the United Church of Canada, and I saw that happen in the United Church of Canada. Um, sometimes they didn't change the actual statement of beliefs, but they redefined what everything meant. I've shared that before. Well, they say the Bible is the word of God, still in their, their statement of beliefs. Of course, they don't believe the Bible is the word of God, <laughs> right? But they just have a way of, you know, lots of things are the word of God, right? So the Bible is just one of the things that is the word of God. And, and definitely they don't have the Bible as the authority on doctrinal matters. You know, that's, but it, they don't have to state these things. But part of what ended up happening with within Adventism is really a change of definitions, so, um, and we'll talk about this more later, but I, I had the pastor who baptized me. I remember having a conversation with him because I was pretty active in the church when I was first baptized. And uh, I, I would, you know, be at the church, you know, during the week sometimes. Uh, and it was during the week, I, him and I were the only ones at the church. And I had this conversation with me, with him, and he said, uh, you know, in a few years, you'll be like all the other church members. You know, you won't, you'll just be sitting in the pew and be, you know, comfortable and, 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 you know, all this energy that you have right now that I can use, um, that's going to disappear. <laughs> it, it, very encouraging statement. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I don't think it, it, it happened to me at least. Well, it did happen for a while, but I was always still very active, even when I was struggling. But um, but we we talked a bit about um, Desmond Ford, and he says, "Well, I'm a Ford man." He says, "Because that's what I was taught in seminary was Desmond Ford's ideas." And he said, "The problem was Desmond Ford, and and Ford, of course, comes out of this uh, it, because of what happened with questions of doctrine is part of what created that environment for people like Desmond Ford and." Uh, pastor, the pastor who baptized me, it opened up that door for this new theology. And, and a lot of it was just definitional of how they, the, the words had changed their meanings. So this is what, what had happened is we had, uh, yeah, well, this is, as uh, Felix says, um, this is what happens when we come to, uh, to the church rather than to Christ, right? So often, often we bring people into the church, right? It, we're not that concerned about bringing them to Christ. You know, we search sea and land to find like one proselyte and make him twofold more a child of hell than we ourselves are. You know, having unconverted Christians, uh, uh, burying people when they're still alive in baptism, is is something that just happens all the time. So anyway, just a comment on that. Yeah. yeah. The pastor that that baptized me, <clears throat> excuse me, nineteen nineteen seventy six, I think. Anyway, nineteen seventy six, I think. But he studied with me for a full year before he baptized me. Yeah. Yeah. Full year. Yeah, the pastor who baptized me, he baptized me the second time I, I darkened the door of a Seventh-day Adventist church. <laughs> it does affect their income. Yeah, well, you know, and and I remember, you know, we went to church once, and then we, at church, we, we wrote down in the offering thing, you know, we want to be baptized. And then uh, he came over and visited, and he set up a date for us to be baptized, which was Christmas Day. And uh, we went there and we got baptized. 
you know, and so that was like like three weeks after we had first gone to church. We didn't go those two intervening weeks. Not sure why, we just didn't. Um, and he said, you know, he wasn't really sure that we were going to actually show up. <laughs> he got everything ready for the baptism, but he hadn't even talked to me, you know, to confirm. He just got it ready as if we were getting baptized and we were there. Um, but, uh, you know, there were some things I didn't agree with or I didn't understand in the, in the statement of beliefs. And, you know, he, you know, like I, everything I would say, he would just agree with, right? He wasn't, he wasn't there to, um, you know, try to convince me of anything. He just wanted me baptized. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> I, me- I remember uh, one particular evangelistic series in Calgary. And uh, at the end of the night, they invited people to come down to the front if they wanted to give their life to God. They did. And then they... You were right said, there, they said stay behind, and they they stayed behind, and there was a group of probably about ten fifteen people, and they're they're instructing them to bring a towel tomorrow and that the and a change of clothes and that they would be baptized. I looked at the the pastor of the church where I was going, and he's a man who also studies for six months to a year with people, mm-hmm. and I looked at him. And I said, they're not going to baptize those people, are they? And he said, "Oh yeah, they are." Yeah, with the evangelistic, uh, the evangelist, they want to baptize people. But um, anyway, it's not really the topic of this conversation so much. I mean, the idea is that we know that that there has been a problem within Adventism. Now, the root of that problem, I mean, it is a theological problem, right? I mean, there is doctrines and so forth that were changed. But the reason why we got to that in the first place was more a spiritual problem within the church. And, you know, and and why does that happen? Why does, is it because of institutionalization? Is it, you know, you have an institution, some people think that institutions always uh, tend towards apostasy. That um, because you have people who have positions and jobs and, People seek those positions even if they're not converted. And people can fool people into believing that they're converted uh, so that they can get those positions of power, right? As we know, the the scum rises to the top. supposed to be the cream, but it seems that the scum tends to. People who want power are not the right kind of people. And and one of the things that Ellen White tried to do um, was suggest, you know, basically – getting rid of the power structure in the church in 1901, the general conference, the problem was that, you know, the power was in the hands of too few people, but it it just seems to be natural that when there's positions of power, the wrong people want to have whatever those positions are. So, you know, you know, we could say that the leadership at the time was just trying to reach out to evangelicals. We could we could look at it in a positive way, and they 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 had some failings um, in doing so. But actually, I believe that there was already um, a belief system that existed within Adventism. It wasn't just that they were, you know, not happy being called a cult. Um, really, they had a lot of sympathies with these other churches with their belief system. That is, they didn't really believe in Adventism overcoming sin and things like that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> May 2nd, this is recorded in the minutes. Uh, E.G. White statements on the atoning work of Christ. Uh, the meeting of the trustees held May 1st closed with no action taken on the question which was discussed at length. Suitable footnotes or explanations regarding the E.G. White statements on the atoning work of Christ which indicate a continuing work at the present time in heaven. Inasmuch as the chairman of our board will be away from Washington for the next four months, and the involvements in this question are such that I, it must have the most careful consideration of counsel, it was voted that we defer consideration until the later time of the matters that were brought to our attention by elders X and Y, involving the E.G. White statements concerning the continuing atoning work of Christ. And so that's from the minutes of the White Board on page 1488. 
It was presumably four months later when Elder Olson had returned that a vote was taken not to grant the request. This was eight months after the first January meeting, by which time the matter had been exposed. <clears throat> now, I'm not sure which Elder Olson that was. There is a few Olsons, but uh, I'm pretty sure it, it's not the same Olson that we're reading uh, in uh, the crisis ahead on, on uh, Sabbath mornings. Okay. Um, so correspondence with Washington. So after this situation came to my knowledge, so as is Andreas and talking again, I did a, a deal of praying, which of course is a very good thing to do. What was my responsibility in this matter? Or did I have any? Now, often when there's a controversy or an issue arising, we don't take the time to pray. And sometimes, you know, we do have a responsibility, uh, but we ignore it. We, we leave it for someone else. And, and it's something that we have to know. It's something that's actually a very difficult question in many situations. Should I act or should I not act? Or if I am to act on such, whatever the situation is, how am I to act? And the only way that we can have an answer to that is the answer of prayer that comes through prayer, right? Thinking about it, talking with our friends. You notice he doesn't go and talk to all of his friends about the situation to ask what he should do. He goes to God. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I like M. L. Andreasen. He's, he's a godly man. I confided in no one, right? Now, can we do that? H have we done that in situations like this? Where we just go to God, Amen. Why, why not? Why not confide in our best friends or take counsel from, you know, other people? I mean, I'm not saying that's wrong to do, but <laughs> because there's there's a there's almost a subconscious influence when we hear the words and counsel of those we trust. Um, yeah, they can sway us without even knowing. It can also confuse uh, confuse us because God is trying to speak to us. And so, you know, that one particular Sabbath, I'm trying to figure out, I'm facing this fellowship. Should I continue studying the 2520 and so on? On the way to church, I stopped behind a car in a city of a million people, and the license plate said, the Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Not a mistake. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it wasn't to follow Jeff. It was to con it confirm to me that 2520 is correct. Yeah. Now, Felix says, of course, Jesus is our best friend, but he is the best counselor. Now, often when people come to us for advice, too, one of the best things to do is point them to Christ. Right. I mean, people sometimes we go to others, you know, if and I've had people who have pointed me to Christ as the answer. But. I'm, I'm not saying that I've always done that. When people have come to me, sometimes I do give my opinion. But depending on the type of thing it is. But there are some things here that only God really can answer. Because he's the one who, who knows everything. We don't, right? Our friends don't. He well, says, I, can, I decided. Okay, go on. I can rem remember going to a friend that I that I trusted. And in in a bit of a crisis, and the friend followed the counsel, take, take them by the hand and pray. They, that friend mm -hmm. right away said, well, let us pray, rather than listening to all the trouble. And that was yeah. you, my friend. That was you, Theodore. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let, let's pray. That was the first thing that you said. Mm -hmm. I'll always remember that, because that's, that's not what I practice. Yeah, well, it's it's what I believe, because especially when people have problems that are overwhelming and hard to know. I mean, God obviously knows the answer to that. So he says, I decided my first responsibility would be to the officials in Washington. So I wrote to headquarters. I was there informed that I had no right to the information I had, that I was that it that was supposed to be secret. And I had no right even to read the documents. Now, 
secret secretness or whatever it is secrecy <laughs> is not of god right right everything needs to be done openly anything secret belongs to god not to yes. us yeah now there are things you know like of a personal nature obviously that you know somebody's involved in like uh, sin or a divorce or something's going on in a person's personal life uh, those things can be kept secret right but this is something that addresses the church and when when the church acts in secret like parminder's movement did back in 2017 they had an organizational meeting in I believe it was france i always get no romania romania i think it was romania and um they had decided that everything about the meeting was supposed to be kept secret and because decisions hadn't been finalized and they didn't want anybody talking about it to anybody. And I knew then that that, that is so insane. Um, I don't believe in secrecy. So this idea that this was supposed to be secret and I had no right even to read the documents. Boy, for a Andreasen, I mean, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure he would feel the same way that I feel about something like that. After four letters were passed, I was told that they did not care to discuss the matter further. The matter was settled. When I inquired if this meant that the door was closed, I received the reply. I've considered the matter to which you have referred as closed, as the scurrilous and um, was closed. What happened here? Oh, is the scurrilous and untrue article in the ministry? Okay, so how is this? So as to the scurrilous and untrue article in the ministry, ministry magazine, I have discussed this with the brethren concerned and would like to leave the matter there. So the door was closed. So they are saying that uh, regarding that article. So, so there's an untrue article in the ministry magazine, and this leader says, I've discussed with this with the brethren concerned and would like to leave the matter there. So the door was closed. Here are some of the official pronouncements. The minutes are confidential and not intended for public use. If wrong is committed, it is forbidden to expose it merely because some want to keep it. Uh, if wrong is committed, is it forbidden to expose it merely because some want to keep it confidential? Obviously not. The reason why do people keep things secret? What what kind of things th that are kept secret? What who likes to keep things secret? Our sins, we hide our sins. We don't want to be exposed. When people are in error, criminals do things in secrecy, right? Sinners do things in secret because they don't come to the light unless their deeds be exposed. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's why I believe in openness, right? that everything needs to be clear and open and and people want things in secret because they're plotting and planning in darkness right they they have hidden agendas nothing should ever be hidden right right you know of of those types of things you are doing this upon hearsay and upon confidential minutes which you had no right even to read so it's another quotation from an official statement official pronouncement no one ever talked to me of this or informed me. I read the minutes and acted upon them. The minutes are not hearsay. They are officially documented and signed, right? So, so he just had read the minutes. Nobody, he didn't listen to hearsay. Uh, you have no right even to read. When I have evidence that it, to me, seems destructive of the faith, Am I to close my eyes to what I consider premeditated attempts to mislead the people by the insertions of notes, explanations, and appendix notes in the books of Mrs. White? Is this officially approved? I wish to repeat, so this is another quotation from my official pronouncement. I wish to repeat what I wrote before, that men have a perfect right to, to go to boards, including the white estate group, and make their suggestions without fear of being disciplined or dealt with as heretics. No, maybe that's Maybe that's his quote. I'm not sure why that one's in quotes. I'm not quite sure. Okay, this is re-emphasized. I reaffirm my former statement that I believe these brethren were entirely in order 
in going to the properly delegated responsible individuals with any suggestion they have for study. And uh, this makes it clear that the act of the two brethren is officially approved, that they did not do anything for which they should be reproved, but that they did what they had perfect right to do. I do not think our people will welcome this new principle. So what, what they're saying in these statements is basically um, people on boards. So I understand the statement now. So people can go to boards, the white estate group, make their suggestions without fear of being disciplined or dealt with as heretics. So he's saying that people who make decisions on boards should be held accountable <laughs> for their decisions, right? Is that what that statement's saying? You understand these statements here? It, it took me a, a bit to figure them out. So so if we go to a board, and it's an official board, um, and we make a decision, we shouldn't be held accountable for those decisions. That's that's what he's saying, that uh, this official. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? It doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah, I, I think we have to be held accountable Amen. for for the decisions we make on boards to say well it was my right you know i had a perfect right to go on the board and and i shouldn't be under fear of being disciplined or dealt with as a heretic because it was on a board it was an official board so um so so people can if you're on a board you can do what you want and you shouldn't be held accountable that's that's what he's saying I this makes it clear that he, it's What's that? In the church. I, I, when I was in the church, I, I, um, the pastor said to me, I can't expect people to do what I ask them when in the church. Like He says, not like running a business. And I said, what's the difference? When I run a business and I ask someone to do something, I expect them to do it. When I'm in the church, if I ask someone to do it, he's saying I can't expect them to do it. It doesn't make sense. Well, I mean, the thing about the church, it is a, a volunteer organization. Um, so I do think that in order to get people to do things, uh, you know, it's not a top down. You just boss people around. You try to find consensus and support uh, for things in the church. But um, but here in this point that uh, that this board could make this these decisions regarding Ellen White's books and the footnotes that they shouldn't be held accountable, which is crazy. This makes it clear that the act of the two brethren is officially approved, that they did not do anything for which they should be reproved, but that they did what they had a perfect right to do. I do not think our people will welcome this new principle, right? So now I understand that statement. To suggest that the good and faithful Seventh-day Adventist men sat down to tamper with the pillars of our faith is as far from the fact as the poles are apart. Tampering with the testimonies when no such thing ever took place, nor was there any attempt ever made to do this. So that's, again, an official pronouncement. It says, I leave to the reader's decision just why the men went to the committee. Did they not come to have insertions, notes, appendix notes, explanations made in some of Ellen G. White's books? While the committee eventually decided not to do this, the guilt of the men is not changed by that fact. To assert that as for tampering with the testimonies when no such thing ever took place, nor was there any attempt ever made to do this, the minutes speak for themselves. So they definitely made an attempt. They didn't succeed, but it doesn't change the fact that they made an attempt. So subtitle here, Serious Situation. This vault episode brings into focus a serious situation. It is not merely a matter of two men, attempting to have insertions made in some of Mrs. White's books. A much more serious thing is that this act had the approval of the administration, who stated that the men had a perfect right to do what they did. This pronouncement opens the way for others to follow. And as the matter is kept secret, great abuse could readily result. Undoubtedly, if the matter is left to a vote of the people, there will be no permission for any to tamper or attempt to tamper with the writings of Ellen G. White. The men who visited the vault May 1st, as related, stated clearly that they had discovered that Mrs. White taught plainly that the atoning work of Christ is now in progress in the heavenly sanctuary. On the other hand, the ministry of February, February 1957 stated the very opposite. It said that the sacrificial act on the cross is a complete, perfect, and final atonement for men's sins. 
questions on doctrine attempts to reconcile these opposing views by stating that whether one hears an Adventist saying or reads in Adventist literature, even in the writings of Ellen G. White, that Christ is making atonement now, it should be understood that we mean simply that Christ is now making application, etc. It is clear that if the atonement on the cross was final, there cannot be a later atonement also final. When we therefore for a hundred years have preached that the day of atonement began in 1844, we were wrong. It ended 1800 years before. The hundreds of books we have published, the more than a million copies of Bible readings we have sold, Millions of handbills we have distributed saying that court week in heaven, that it is court week in heaven, were all false doctrine. But the Bible instruction we have given, the Bible instruction we have given the children and the young ministry and which we have imbibed as Bible truth is a fable. Uriah Smith, Loughborough, Andrews, Andros, Watson, Daniel, Branson, Johnson, Lacey, Spider, Haskell, Spicer, I mean. Haskell, Gilbert, and a host of others stand convicted of having taught this false, uh, taught false doctrine. The whole denomination whose chief contribution to Christianity is the sanctuary doctrine and Christ's ministry must now confess we were all wrong, and that we have no message to the world for these last days. In other words, we are deceived and deceiving people. The fact that we may have been honest does not alter the fact that we have given a false message. Take away from us the sanctuary question, the investigative judgment, the message of the 2300 days, Christ's work in the most holy. And we have no right to exist as a denominated people, as God's messengers to a doomed world. If the spirit of prophecy has led us astray these many years, let us throw it away. But no, halt. God has not led us astray. We have not told cunningly, cunningly devised fables. We have a message that will stand the test and confound the undermining theories that are finding their way in among us. In this instance, it is not the people that have gone astray, except as they have followed the leaders. It is time that there be a turnabout. Now, we think about this. This is the late 1950s. That was a long time ago, like 65 years ago or more. And. M.L. Andreessen was able to see the direction the church was going, but very few people picked up on what was happening. And, and this opened up a door of, um, that has, has misled Adventism for a long time. Now, I know pastors who don't believe in the 2300 days. They don't believe in the investigative judgment. Now, we know that Ford was, uh, you know, had his credentials removed in, in 1980 uh, because he had rejected that message. But many, and many pastors left the church. Many people left the church when uh, Ford was dealt with. But many stayed who still agreed with Ford, such as the pastor who baptized me. But I think right now, very few Adventists really understand these issues. And now there's there's a problem here, right? Because we know that there are two different issues that uh, Andreasen particularly stands in opposition to. So the, the idea that uh, that the atonement was completed at the cross, where Andreasen says, no, Christ is still making atonement, right? That's that's there's a work of atonement. The sacrifice for the atonement was complete, right? So you slay the animal, that animal doesn't have to continue to be slain, right? Christ doesn't have to die every day, okay? But he still, as our high priest, has to make atonement. Now, now they, they, they're they playing around with words. They're saying, well, there's just an application made. But that is atonement. When when the priest makes application of the blood, is is he is he making atonement? Is the atonement completed just when the sacrifice is offered in the sanctuary? I mean, if we're using the sanctuary service, we know that the atonement is not complete. It's not even completed in the daily service. It's not till the day of atonement. But even then, even for the daily service, there still is atonement constantly being made. Right. There isn't just one animal slain and then that's it. 
There, there still is the ministration of the priests. And that is atonement. And they have the day of atonement where atonement is completed. It, if, if we're going to follow the biblical types, we have to accept that. So there obviously wasn't a turnabout in Adventism. And yet we have people who who do believe in the in some ways, in the correct view of the nature of Christ, they believe Christ had a sinful nature, and they still believe in uh, the investigative judgment. But there's there's some deeper problems that still exist that that I think are are here, you know, being that, that we can see this idea of secrecy, uh, the way in which the organization operates. Okay, well, let's go on and read. It says, for now, more than four years ago, that the apostasy began to be plainly evident. So he's using the word apostasy, right? Which which I believe is correct. Since that time, there has been a deliberate attempt to weaken the faith in the spirit of prophecy, as it is clear that as long as the people revere the gift given us, they cannot be led far astray. Now, what does Ellen White say about that? Anybody uh, know the quote? There's a statement, I'm trying to remember how it goes, something about um, attacking the testimonies. Okay, so it would be something like none of none effect. Yeah, right. I'll find the statement here. If the preconceived opinions of particular ideas of some are crossed in being reproved by testimonies, they have a burden at once to make plain their position to discriminate between the testimonies. Defining what is Sister White's human judgment and what is the word of God. Everything that sustains their cherished ideas is divine. And the testimonies to correct their errors are human. Sister White's opinions. They make of none effect the counsel of God by their tradition. And people have done that with uh, uh, the scriptures as well. So there's lots of statements regarding this. But uh, I was trying to find the, the one, one of the first things that they're going to do is make of none effect in the spirit of prophecy or something to that effect. Yeah, I've read that before, but I can't remember where. It's at. Yeah. Great controversy, I'd say. Um, it's not in the great controversy. Um, mm-hmm. No. What do you think, babe? I got one card there, though. I what? Think. Selected messages. Book one, forty eight point three. Okay. Is, um, Satan will be be to make of non effect the testimonies of the Spirit of God, where yeah. there so the last deception of Satan, right? Is that what you said? The very last deception of Satan will be to make of non effect. Go on. Oh, it's the very last deception of. Satan will be to make of none effect the testimonies of the Spirit of God where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 28, 29, 18. Satan will work in ingeniously, ingeniously in different ways and through different, different agencies. I think is right to tell yep. the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. Right. So so if we think about that very last deception of Satan within the Adventist church um, is to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. To unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. So, So obviously those things have been happening for quite a while. So to say it's the last, the very last deception means we're in the very last deception within Adventism. Okay. Um, it is clear that it's long. I'm sorry. It's, that? It's, yeah. it's originally, it's originally, it's originally from letters 12, 1890. Yeah. Letter 12, 1890. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. It is now more than four years. So we read that part. Okay. Um, yeah. So um 
Yeah, since that time, there's been a deliberate attempt to weaken the faith and the spirit of prophecy, as it is clear that as long as the people revere the gift given us, they cannot be led far astray. If of this, we shall speak shortly. The time for action has come. The time to open up the dark corners has arrived. There must no longer be secret agreements, no compact with other denominations who hate the law and the Sabbath and who ridicule our most holy faith. We must no longer hobnob with enemies of the truth. No more, no more promise that we will not proselytize. We must not tolerate leadership which condones tampering with the writings of an entrusted to us and stigmatizes as belonging to the lunatic fringe those who dare disagree with them. We must no longer remain silent. To thy tents, O Israel. Okay. So, anyway, I think we'll leave leave it at that for for what we read today. But but we need to think about this because obviously it's pretty easy to look at the problems that exist within the church and to have an us and them attitude. What we have to recognize always is that we have lessons to learn from this in our own doings, in our own midst. And um, so I think it is very important that uh, we make sure that none of us operate in that way. Um, you know, what, why, why do people, now we, we read the statement there, but why do people, why do people, and, and this relates to the, like these secret meetings as well. So I'm just going to bring this up here, this quote. So the question is, why do people do things in secret? Why do people uh, reject the testimonies? So here we have just before that in this uh, book, Selected Messages, Manuscript 73, 1908. It says, some who are not willing to receive the light, but who prefer to walk in ways of their own choosing, will search the testimonies to find something in them to encourage the spirit of unbelief and disobedience. Thus, a spirit of disunion will be brought in. For the spirit which leads them to criticize the testimonies will also lead them to watch their brethren to find in them something to condemn. So we can see behind it is an unwillingness to deal with sin in your own lives. And, and it's the same spirit that looks for sin in others. Can, can we see why that is? That the work, so we may not be, you know, criticizing the spirit of prophecy. We could be people say, I believe in the spirit of prophecy, right? But it's the same spirit that leads us in criticizing Others, right? Amen. Can we see that? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Right. So sometimes we can think we're on the right side of the issue. We can believe in the in the sinful human nature of Christ. We can believe in, uh, you know, Christ is we're, right now. We're in the Day of Atonement, and that there's this investigative judgment going on. You know, we can believe in a lot of present truth, but there's a spirit of disunion, right? And and so some people aren't in open opposition to the testimonies, right? Sometimes we could be supporting the testimonies, at least with our words. But it's the same spirit. We need to recognize how disastrous it is to be looking for sins in others so that we can have excuses for the sins in our own lives. We, we want to see the shortcomings in others so that we don't have to address the shortcomings in ourselves. And, and, and that's how we have to look at everything when we study, when we read things. It's not about them. It's about us. Yeah. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, as Felix points there. And, and sometimes we are accusers of the brethren. Now, I know Felix and I dealt with some problems down there in, in Australia that are going on in some of the churches. And, you know, we have to be really, really careful 
that we weren't making man our enemy, that we could see the, the work that Satan was doing and to be redemptive in our approach. And, and it's very difficult. Satan has, has put a lot of us in a very hard place because there are people who are basically innocent bystanders, so to speak. There's people that are victims of, of these errors that have come into Adventism. And those people are not our enemies. But often Satan's work is done by us in order to stand up for the truth. We make people our enemies instead of Satan and error being our enemies. So to be redemptive in our in our dealings with others who are in error, whether um, they're the ones leading out in the error or whether they're ones who are just affected by the error. But we have to be very, very careful. Now, you know, I like what, what we read here today. Emma Andreasen sought God. He took, I believe correctly, the action that God asked him to take, to stand up and be counted. That caused the removal of his credentials, which, you know, they gave back to him after he died, but that uh, uh, it really didn't help much. Now, I think part of it had to do with the fact that his wife um, didn't when when they took away his credentials, she didn't get a full pension or something like that, if I remember correctly. Um, but, uh, you know, we often have this sort of uh, censoring instead of because things are done secretly. People don't want to know what's going on. And we've, we've had this in our movement as well. So we've had uh, people being censored. Uh, we've had uh, disunity. And, and the question we have to ask ourselves is, uh, what part did we have to play in that? And what can we do about it? And so we really need to seek God in prayer. Like right now in the situation within this movement, um, you know, we are, at, you know, a scattered and peeled people, right? You know, the movement seems to basically, all we have left now is basically this, this little study group which of insignificant people. Yet we believe that God is in charge. Uh, Felix says here, the most important thing for all of us is what does God want us to do? And we need to keep focused on what God shows us. We need to do uh, what what we need to do and be led with his spirit. Right. So it's it is important individually that we do the things that God puts before us and, and often the little things. Right. So one is dealing with things in our own life first, because we're not going to be able to help other people if we don't have how our house in order. And and that's a daily battle. Right. Uh, being a Christian is a daily battle. It's not like you just get it settled. Just like keeping your house in order, uh, you don't just clean up your house one day and it's clean forever. There's still lots of cleaning that needs to get done on on a daily basis, and it's the same in our life. Um, so we have to keep our house in order, and we have to spend time in prayer, uh, as M. L. Andreasen did. We know that there is a crisis happening around us within the church, within the movement. And if we do what God asks us to do, he will take care of all the rest. So and any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I had a thought uh, this week. Uh, uh, stirring the pot on the... Uh, one post that's so controversial I haven't fully finished with that one um, so a person is coming to me posting oh what was it no it was a different one it was about the Olympics and some pastor saying you know the, that he's really that the vitriol that Christians are throwing oh, yeah. sinners right? and so the one person says you know if they got it wrong you know, you're supposed to go and sin no more and I, uh, I, I just said that I look forward to the day when I can go and sin no more. And it, it occurred to me that Jesus is speaking of the hundred and forty-four thousand men. Do you think? Yeah. Well, and and of course, it, to all of us. Yes, I mean, all of us. God but is who never will... going to say, 
uh, you know, it's like, you know, if a, a police officer pulls you over, gives you a speeding ticket. He's not going to mm-hmm. say, oh, you know, now you can just speed all you want. He's mm-hmm. going to say, please don't speed again. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that is what God wants for us. And there's no excuse. I'm not trying to make an excuse. I'm just saying that, that the 144,000 are the people who will be as Christ was. Yeah. But yeah. they won't see themselves that way. That's right. And when you start seeing yourself that way, like one one fellow said, yeah, I stopped sinning when I left the Seventh Day Adventist Church. I don't know (laughs) exactly what that meant. Well, I I know what he meant. He meant now that he didn't uh, have to look at his sins, he was okay in his own eyes. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, any any other thoughts? Well, uh, hopefully we learned something today. I'd learned something anyway. And it's something we really need to pray about. These these studies that we've been doing on all the different studies, some of them are going to be, you know, coming to an end at some point here. And there's going to be different topics to study. And, uh, you know, figuring out exactly what God wants us to do. It's a tough one. Sometimes I, I, I don't want to think about it because there's too much work to do. But I try to do the things that are right before me. But there is other things that, that uh, I got to get working on. So, okay, well, let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the lessons that you teach us. We know, Lord, that um, things have gone awry in the Adventist church, been wrong for a long time, and also in our lives. We know, Lord, that. You want to heal us. You want to reform us. You want to give us new life. And uh, we pray this for those that we love in the church. We know, Lord, that uh, your love extends to all men. And help us to reveal that love to others. And even in correcting them, help us, Lord, to be corrected. We pray for the Sabbath for the studies tomorrow. And um, we just ask, Lord, that you can continue to to lead and guide. We ask for your, your hand to be upon each person. We, we hardly know what other people are going through. We know that there's some difficult times ahead and difficult times presently. And we just pray that uh, you can help each one of us and the decisions that we make each day, that you can strengthen us. We pray for our families, for our loved ones. We pray for those who we come in contact with. And we just ask that we can reflect your character to all. And uh, we pray that uh, we can come again to study your word, that we can come close to you and to one another. We pray this and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.